In 2004, when Anila joined the Sun, she was wearing a headscarf. A year on, she decided to take it off. I can relate to that. I wore the headscarf when I was kind of in my like late teens, early twenties, and then I took it off. Mm. And I have my own reasons for doing mm. that. But what were, what were your reasons? I just felt as if our religion was being dragged through the mud, and I wanted to show that um, it's not like that really. And the most visible way I think for a woman is to wear the headscarf. And then slowly, slowly, I just kind of thought, oh, well, there's far more important things I should be doing rather than covering my hair, you know, so just praying five times a day. When I went to Pakistan, nobody was wearing it. You see more girls in this country wearing a headscarf than you do back in Pakistan. I think there is um, a very conscious sort of move towards um, being more Islamic. I think people are trying to get more into their um, roots. So Islamic, not necessarily more Arab? I think Pakistani people might just think that Arabic culture is going to be right. Because Islam started in Arabia, so whatever Arab people do to Pakistanis, that is authentic. We don't speak Arabic, it's, we speak Urdu. Whereas Arab people, they don't have to learn Arabic to read the Quran. Whereas we send our children to mosque to learn Arabic to read the Quran. Yeah. So Arab people are seen as very lucky. Really? So they're, being, they're put on a bit of a pedestal? Yeah, kind of I think so. Because that's the heart of the religion. That's where the religion started. It's because strange to me that you don't realise that. Well, because I, I do, but to be honest, in theory, I'm uncomfortable with it. Because, you know, in religious grounds, everyone is seen equal in the eyes of God, whether you're an Arab or a non-Arab. Just because I'm no, an no, Arab I don't and mean, I can no. speak Arabic doesn't make me better. Than a Pakistani. But then you're closer to the faith because you can understand. And I think yes. if you're not from that culture, then anything Arab, you would think that that is better. Automatically, that's better. I've been thinking a lot about what Anila said. And to be honest, I have heard people talk about this before. It's old fashioned prejudice, really. And it makes me feel really sad and angry that people would think they're any less of a good Muslim because they can't speak Arabic. I mean, it's ridiculous. We should be moving forwards, not backwards. I don't think there's any room for it in a modern Muslim world. And to be honest, I think it's a load of rubbish. I haven't got any time for it. I was so upset that I did the only thing I know to get me back into my groove. I went shopping. Now this place is really famous. People come from all over the country to go shopping here. And I thought I wanted to find out what all the fuss is about. This shop's basically an Asian John Lewis. It's got everything that you could want. Clothes, jewelry, makeup, and it's even got a video section. Lots of Bollywood films. And apparently this is a really well kept secret. It's basically turmeric skin cream. It's really popular, especially amongst brides because it gives your face a really beautiful glow, a bit like Beauty Flash Balm. One thing the Asians and Arabs have got in common is their love of bling. Look at the heel on this. Cindy's were kind of big when I was a kid, and I never had one. I just thought she just looked completely different to me. Just blonde hair and skinny. I had curly hair and I was fat, and I just thought, no, I don't really, I just didn't, couldn't relate to her. So I'm glad nowadays kids have got things like Asian Barbies. Everyone knows London is a global fashion hotspot and its effects have hit the Muslim fashion scene in a spectacular way. I'm going to a fashion show and you're coming with me. These abayas are usually associated with Arab women in the Middle East. But this collection has been designed by Yasmin Safri, a graduate from the London College of Fashion. She's making big waves this season, so I asked her to put on a show for me and her customers so we could see her latest designs. What inspires you to make your abayas? I think the, you know, the, the, the constant parade of uh, the Arabs that used to glide down the malls, you know, uh, on the escalators, and I just found it really fascinating that they can just maintain their elegance in this plain black outfit. It was just amazing. And I think that shows the freedom of women as well, that they have completely covered, but yet they have the confidence to look beautiful at the same time. I thought, this is my niche. There's no point in me being another Asian designer that has fusion of Western uh, sort of clothes. You know, why mm. not gear towards the East? Do you ever get some non-Muslim clients buying these? We do. And I, I, I actually really 
really find that um, that that's exactly what I want to do is, is touch those people that don't actually have no knowledge of it and they actually find the clothes really beautiful to wear and I think that's what we're about we're sending out a message to Western people that you know it can be beautiful to wear a buyer. Yeah. I really like um, what Yasmin's done with the abaya. I mean, she's completely deconstructed it. If I walked in here, apart from the black ones, um, the others I wouldn't be able to recognise as abayas. But she's catering for a British Muslim market that do want more colour and want different styles. I think it's really groovy what she is doing. Modelling is a complete no-no for most Muslim girls. Too immodest. That means most of Yasmin's models are non-Muslims. So she needs to explain some rules about how to walk the walk modestly. When we're walking we keep it very very neutral. The whole idea is to enhance the clothes and not so much the woman's body, you know, the chest, the, the hips. You definitely need one dress for each model. Do you want me to help with the scarf or something? That's an unusual way that you've got the scarf. <laughs> I, think, I think that's just for effect. I don't think anyone would really wear it like that. I'm Why don't you put there. the scarves on like this? Okay. Sorry, I should just not get them on. Sorry, I'm just trying to help. See, the one thing about Muslim fashion is it does take time to get ready, doesn't it? <laughs> you have to take your time. There is a technique. It looks simple, but it's quite, it's quite difficult. That's cool. Yeah, good to go, I'll say. Whilst it's all mayhem upstairs, I go down to join Yasmin's invited guests who, like at any fashion show, are eager for the sartorial action to begin. Uh. Yasmin's top designs go for £350. What do you think of the fashion show? I think it was wonderful, pretty original, things that you don't normally uh, able to see in shops. I think it's quite unique in the sense that it's offering an alternative choice for women. Well, the other way it's kind of um, transgressed um, national boundaries, if you like, especially for Muslims in particular. I mean, Bangladesh is kind of more salwar kameez and saris, but we don't take that as a kind of Islamic dress as such. It's kind of more casual wear that you wear at home. Isn't fashion amazing? The clothes we wear say so much about us. Until now, I've always regarded the abaya as an Arabic garment, part of my Arab identity. But now loads of Asian Muslim women are wearing it, not just in the fashion show, but out in the streets of the UK. What's all that about? Saika, a former fitness instructor, started wearing the abaya only six months ago. Her friend Nasreen's been wearing it for just over a year. You know, a lot of people, when you go dressed the way you are to like the Middle East, they'll probably think you're an Arab. Does that upset you anyway? Do you feel like saying, no, 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 I'm Pakistani? How do you feel about that? I don't mind. So long as people know I'm a Muslim. In Islam, there is no superiority of one race above another. So therefore, being mistaken to be an Arab, well, I don't mind. But don't you feel like proud of also like your Pakistani roots, your British roots? Of course, of course. We're, we're proud to be British. But essentially, because we are Muslims, there's no nationalism in Islam. So, you know, we embrace that fact that if someone mistakes us for an Arab or whether we're Pakistani, it's all the same to us. We're all Muslims together. Yes, it doesn't matter. Why don't you wear the shawar kameez? With the shalwar kameez you have the traditional dabatta or the scarf, uh, which I don't feel really does the job in covering your hair. However, with the hijab, um, the way I'm wearing it now, the way that Saika's wearing it, it completely covers all the hair and is just the epitome of modesty, as far as I can tell. I feel, personally, that when I wear the shalwar kameez, the first thing I'm saying is that I'm Pakistani and then I'm Muslim. The that's not the first thing, yeah, the most the important, most important thing. thing is that I'm Muslim first and then I'm Pakistani. Being a British Muslim woman in this country, you're being pulled in three different directions. You're British, you believe in Islam, and you have Pakistani culture. For them, when it comes to dress, religion is the most important thing. Whilst those two are getting out of their shulwa kameezes and into an abaya, I'm getting out of mine to get into a shulwa kameez. I've been invited to a really glam party tonight by one of Britain's most prominent Pakistani women, so I need to get a shulwa kameez. This is Southall Broadway, so if I'm going to find one anywhere, it'll be here. Asians from all over the country come to Southall for up-to-the-minute styles. It's right next to Heathrow, so they can get the latest designs fresh off the plane. 
I'm really actually loving the shawar kameez. It's so comfortable. I think the Pakistanis have really hit the nail on the head because they've got something that's practical and they can wear like out in the streets everywhere and in London, but still they've kept their bling and they've kept their culture. Time for my Pakistani Muslim makeover. There's only an hour to go and I'm already feeling a little bit nervous. Everyone's going to be really dressed up, so hopefully I'll look the part. This is the official home of Dr. Malia Lodi, the first female High Commissioner of Pakistan to the United Kingdom. Before that, she was Pakistan's ambassador in Washington, where she dealt with the fallout of 9-11. Oxford educated, high powered and elegant, She's invited me and a few of her friends round for a women's only party. Nice Welcome. You. Thank you very much. You'll never believe this, but I persuaded her to show me her wardrobe. Wow. These are all your shawar kameezes. These are my shawar kameezes. This is very modern. Now, some clothes you can wear with a jacket on top. This is more traditional embroidery. And this is a very modern take. Wow. <laughs> take yes. on the veil. That's lovely. It's just so modern now, uh, yeah. the shalwar kameez. You see it on the streets of London, you see it on the streets of New York. So it's no longer what many people used to see as fancy dress. Yeah. It's something which is very, very common now. A woman with Dr. Lodi's experience should have a view on why so many women are choosing to veil. A lot of people are saying that the hijab now is becoming quite political. What do you think about that? Well, I think the hijab is a matter of personal choice. I don't think we should exaggerate it out of all proportion and see it as some kind of a threat, which it is not. Uh, it is an exercise of personal choice. But I don't think that emphasizing uh, a religious identity necessarily means that uh, we are going to see extremist behavior. Mm. Uh, I think that's a mistake. In the garden, the party is in full swing. The movers and shakers of female Pakistani society are here. Only a few heads covered. Do you think dressing modestly prevents you from being fashionable? Not at all, because funnily enough, everybody I know knows me for my clothes. And what's really nice is to get complimented on your clothes when you are dressed modestly. When we were growing up, you didn't wear pashminas. You didn't wear kind of um, Alibaba shoes that everybody's wearing now. You didn't wear even flip-flops. I mean, it wasn't cool to wear sandals. And now everybody's wearing it. It wasn't cool to wear tunics. If you were seen outside with your parents wearing shawar kameez, you'd die. Everything Asian has become trendy. That hijab debate rolls on. I went past some women and all that I could see was their eyes. And those women were frightening. And to be honest, if I as a Muslim find those women frightening, then the average person on the street is never going to be able to identify with it. Why should we let these kind of women decide that they're going to decide the forum, they're going to decide the platform on which every single Muslim woman is going to be seen on? I've never been to a party before where the conversations replay so clearly in my mind the next day. I've travelled all around the globe, yet it's in the land where I live that I've learnt the most. The Asian women that I've met have opened my eyes to a completely different female Muslim culture. The clothes that Muslim women wear here are important to them. One group are altering everything Western to suit their modesty, whilst another group are looking outside the UK to suit their rules. Now I can understand both these things, and just like these women, I'll always be adapting and discovering new aspects of my identity. Next week, come with me to Holland, where I get dressed up as a bee girl with the help of some Muslim rappers. I do feel like I could start dancing. Yeah. Witness a burqa bonanza and end up at a Moroccan wedding. <laughs>